season when they commemorated 25 years of their football past, the Kansas City Chiefs strode purposefully into their future. 1984 produced its share of rough moments, punctuated by a mid-season four-game losing streak. But the Chiefs never quit, never stopped working to improve. And by season's end, this young and talented band of Chiefs had turned away defeat and welcomed victory. Division rivals Denver, Seattle, and San Diego all fell victim to the Chiefs' whirlwind finish. The turnaround was a tribute to head coach John McAvick. A teacher, a leader, a man whose composed and positive approach is steadily building the confidence of his young team. You see him waggle. Play for check down. You need to get to the middle of the field. We were formation into the boundary. 83 fullback out. Didn't that linebacker ride you hard? No, that was 27. Oh, that was a man on you. Or if it's a man. This man is probably the most positive man I've been around. Way to go, way to play. He has come in and changed the attitude of the entire team. It started way back in minicamp. And, and there's more of an enthusiastic and winning attitude on this team than I've ever seen since I've been here. The 1984 Chiefs finished the year as one of the toughest teams in the AFC. The importance of their season-ending winning streak cannot be overlooked. The Chiefs stayed together, battled back, never gave in. John Makovic's Kansas City Chiefs closed out their silver season as a team together. Nineteen eighty-four began with starting quarterback and four thousand yard passer Bill Kenny sidelined with a broken thumb. Todd Blackledge would make his first NFL start at Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium. Not a pleasant spot for a coming out party. But Blackledge disdained the new steel curtain and calmly directed the Chiefs to victory. Two Blackledge touchdowns and two more by running back Theotis Brown, number 27, were the difference as the Chiefs prevailed 37 to 27. Brown's measure of respect, both on and off the field, carried through the entire season and will be sorely missed when the 85 campaign begins. But this opening day belonged to the young understudy, whose boyish enthusiasm masked a professional cool that marked the overall strength of the Chiefs quarterback position. A week later, the site was Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium, and Blackledge, behind the sturdy offensive line of Matt Herkenhoff, Brad Buddy, Bob Rush, Tom Condon, Rich Baldinger, Jim Rourke, and John Alt, again led the Chiefs to victory. Spectacular support came from wide receivers Anthony Hancock and Carlos Carson. Get up first down, he's straight back. Wings the right side of the end zone. Carson, touchdown! Blackledge once more was the leading man as the Chiefs earned their second impressive road win. Three weeks later, against Cleveland at Arrowhead, it was the defense that commanded center stage. In a devastating display of defensive might, the Chiefs recorded a team record 11 quarterback sacks, and they added four interceptions. Rookies Kevin Ross and first-round pick Bill Moss, number 63, were prime movers in an assault that shattered Cleveland's offense. It was NFL defense at its best, and Chiefs fans were beginning to realize that this unit, with its potent mix of experienced leadership and youthful exuberance, had the ingredients to evolve into one of the AFC's best. Men like linebackers Gary Spaney, Jerry Blanton, and defensive end Mike Bell were all young, yet experienced veterans, setting the tone for an aggressive defense.
It all started on the defensive line. Bell and fellow end, Art Still, were the main men as the Chiefs established a new team record for quarterback sacks in one season. Bell, in his sixth year, joined the elite of NFL sack specialists, and he teamed with All-Pro Still, number 67, to give the Chiefs the finest pair of pass-rushing defensive ends in pro football. Joining this dynamic duo up front was rugged rookie nose tackle Bill Moss. Moss anchored the middle of a dominating defensive line. The trio was bolstered by some key supporting performers, including veterans Ken Kramer and Dave Lindstrom. A revamped linebacking corps was headed by consistent Gary Spaney and featured several young players, including rookies number 97 Scott Radisek and Jeff Payne, and first-year chief Ken McAllister, who stepped in and responded well. Youth was also served in the secondary, where no chief has more than four years of NFL experience. Yet this acrobatic group is already one of the league's most larcenous. For the second straight season, All-Pro Safety Duran Cherry, number 20, was among the leaders in interceptions, and in 1984, he had lots of help. Rookie cornerback Kevin Ross, number 31, went from seventh round draft choice to starter, and was voted the Mac Lee Hill Award winner by the Chiefs veterans. Dependable Lloyd Burris, number 34, and second-year cornerback Albert Lewis completed a foursome that can only get better. And with situation specialists Greg Hill and Mark Robinson, 1985 looks to be the year this secondary becomes one of the NFL's best. The early season successes could not hide the fact that the Chiefs were playing inconsistent football. The three wins were matched by three defeats, and they entered a Week 7 meeting with San Diego needing a victory. Home at Arrowhead, the Chiefs began tentatively, and in the second half, they looked to Bill Kenny for a spark. Kenny was playing for the first time in 1984, and he performed as if he had never been away. In less than a half, number nine threw for 238 yards as the passing game rolled over San Diego. Kenny's touchdown to Stephon Page gave the Chiefs a lead they never relinquished. Kenny scans the secondary. Kenny waits and guns it left. He's got Page to the 10 to the 5. Page to the end zone for the touchdown. With Kenny in control, the Chiefs' offense exploded. The final touch was provided by rookie running back Herman Hurd. First and 10, Kansas City. The blitz is on. The pitch goes to Hurd. A sweep to the right side. He turns to the 30, 35. Out of speed to the 40. Right. right sideline. One man All to right. beat him. And he's not going to catch him. Herman Hurd to the 20, 10, 5. Touchdown, Kansas City. 69 yard run by Herman Hurd. The Chiefs were winners in a game they had to have. There were many supporting players, but the featured performer was the man who had made his first 1984 appearance, Bill Kenny. Kenny is a survivor in the true sense of the word. After playing quarterback only one full season in college, he was the next to the last player selected in the 1978 draft. Traded by Miami and released outright by the Redskins, Kenny had his own doubts about his football future. I wasn't sure that I was going to make an NFL club. I was hoping I could. I, I didn't think of being a starter. In fact, when I first made it with the Kansas City Chiefs, I can remember telling my uh, wife that I thought I really pulled the, pulled the wool over their eyes because I did not think I was good enough to play in the NFL. 
McKinney was wrong, and he went out and proved it. His rise up the league's quarterbacking ladder was swift, as he passed his way from sometime starter into the NFL record book in one short season. The record shows that all Kenny lacked was confidence. The physical skills were obviously there. John McAvoy helped instill the missing element. Go, Bill. Way to go. Coach McAvoy just trying to build me up and build me up. And I think because of that, I developed more confidence myself. And I was, I was waiting for the opportunity to say, OK, hey, it's your ball. Go out and play. And uh, Coach McAvoy finally said that. He said, you're my quarterback. We're going to live or die with you. So go to it. Diamond left, Ray, 13 week. And if you get any pressure, tell Carlos you're going to look for him. Down here, let's not try to get too greedy. Just work the play. Tell those guys to uncover. A common sideline sight. Coach and quarterback working as one. They were in zone, so he stayed up. I saw it zone, too. I just, see, I saw Carlos open up so quick. I tried to zip right in the hole yeah. for the first down. Yeah. He knows quarterbacks. He knows the passing game, and as a head coach who knows the passing games, he knows a quarterback's not going to go out and hit 65% of his passes every single game, week in and week out, not throw any interceptions. That boosted my confidence because I never had a head coach who had confidence in me as a quarterback. If confidence was the key, then Makovic certainly unlocked the door. Kenny's weapons are many, including a wide receiving core as deep as it is talented. No team can match the Chiefs' diverse array of quality and quantity. Anthony Hancock, J.T. Smith, and Stephon Page. And starters, Henry Marshall and Carlos Carson. The range runs from the solid to the sensational. In 1984, the ever-consistent Marshall turned in his finest season with the Chiefs, and he combined with Carson to make things very difficult on opposing secondary. Carson is the small but slick deep threat, a 1,000-yard receiver for the second consecutive season. His speed and catching ability allow him to outdistance the defense and provide the perfect complement to the bigger Marshall, a terror over the middle. Number 89 catches the ball in traffic as well as anyone. And the rest of the league is now finding out what Chiefs fans have known for years. Henry Marshall is an outstanding wide receiver. Kenny's return was not enough. Another loss followed the San Diego win. And at 1984's midpoint, the Chiefs stood poised, their future unclear. It brightened against Tampa on the season's ninth Sunday. 27-yard line, Tampa Bay territory. Chiefs are leading by a point. The blitz oh, the is on. Here they come. The they Kenny come. back to throw. Pop flies the left side for Marshall over the shoulder. Yes, sir. To the five. Touchdown! This Kenny to Marshall score was the difference in a 24-20 victory. It would be the Chiefs' last for over a month. The nightmare began in Seattle. Interceptions, bad breaks, near misses, all added up as the Chiefs lost three in a row and faced playoff elimination. But they rebounded on the road against the Giants. Due in large part to some brilliant individual efforts, like this one by wide receiver Stephon Page. Hancock in the slot right side, Page slot left, Kenny takes the snap, has protection, Kenny looking around, Ray goes left side, Page is out there, and the pass caught by Page! For three and a half quarters, the Chiefs dominated the game, both offensively and defensively. They used three interceptions by the young secondary and three scoring passes by Kenny to build a 27 to 14 fourth quarter lead. But it was not to be. 
The Chiefs fell in the closing minutes, their fourth straight defeat. A season once so promising now needed to be salvaged. The 1984 Chiefs stood at the crossroads. Their record was 5-8. and eight. The playoffs were no longer possible. Three games remained, all against division opponents. How they performed would say a great deal about their season. More importantly, it would speak volumes about a future that was presently clouded. Would the Chiefs settle for a losing season? Or would they fight to the finish, never giving in? The answer began to unfold against Denver in the first of the divisional battles. Quickly behind 10 to nothing, the Chiefs' defense asserted itself and shut out the Broncos the rest of the way. Strong play came from many different people. Defensive end, Art Still. Linebackers, Jerry Blanton and Calvin Daniels. Lineman, Eric Holly and strong safety, Lloyd Burris. It was team defense at its best, and the outstanding play did not stop there. The special teams figured dramatically. League-leading punter Jim Arnold's booming kicks paved the way for excellent coverage. Led by Mark Robinson, Ken Jolly, Adam Lingner, Kevin Ross, Albert Lewis, Greg Hill, and Ken McAllister. And it was Nick Lowry's three fourth-quarter field goals that provided the winning margin in the 16-10 victory. The Chiefs proudly refused defeat. But there were two more barriers to cross. Seattle was next. It was only a month before that the Seahawks had intercepted six Chiefs passes in a 45 to nothing win. But on this day at Arrowhead, the past withered away and a mightier present soared. The defense, with rookies like number 95 Jeff Payne playing more prominent roles, was again dominant. This time, the Chiefs picked off six passes, and a scoring return by rookie Scott Radasek set the stage for a round. Back to throw, Craig, looking right, all the way. Now he throws it right, intercepted by Radasek. 15, 10, 5, touchdown! But the game was more than another strong defensive showing. It was the Chiefs' finest overall performance of the season, and it came against a Seahawk team tied for the division lead. The offense was led by Kenny and Marshall. Marshall's best day of 1984 produced eight catches, 166 yards, and a second quarter touchdown that put the game out of reach before halftime. Here's the snap to Kenny. Sets up, pumps once, now being flushed out of the pocket, throws it over the middle. He's got Marshall at the five to the goal line. Touchdown! The Chiefs triumphed 34 to seven, and now are in a position to accomplish something no Chiefs team had done in 12 years end a season with three consecutive victories. John Makovic's Chiefs had pulled together in the toughest of times, never losing sight of their goal to improve each and every week. The final test took place against San Diego, a team the Chiefs had not swept a season series from in 11 years. But the Chiefs had come too far to be denied now. Beginning with Billy Jackson's short run on their opening drive, the Chiefs scored on their first three possessions. This was not just a routine late season turnaround. It was the coming together of a young team exemplified by unheralded rookies like Mark Robinson, number 30, and an improved offensive line that held together through injury and change with the likes of second-year tackle David Lutz, number 72, and Brad Buddy, who enjoyed his best season. The surge was most evident in the revitalized running game that broadened the offensive base. 
Chargers appear to be in a blitz with the linebackers, and here they come. Kenny has time. He floats the middle, going for Page, makes the catch, cutting left, 35 to the 30, and he'll go all the way. Touchdown, Stephon Page. The Chiefs rolled over the Chargers in another powerful display of all-around football. The Chiefs had battled back. They had not surrendered. This team was clearly ready to move forward. In 1984, the silver anniversary of Lamar Hunt's founding of the American Football League, the Kansas City Chiefs looked back. It was a year to honor the proud tradition of a franchise that has produced championship teams and outstanding individuals and captured the hearts and minds of fans of all ages. But this year of silver celebration aroused much more than memories of great teams and great players gone by. 1984 stirred thoughts of winning teams to come. The Chiefs will take the field in 1985 knowing that they can beat the best in the AFC West, pro football's toughest division. A change in attitude has been forged, and the Chiefs have now developed the confidence that goes with building a winner. There's such a fine line between the teams that go to the playoffs and the teams that stay home. It's, it really is. I think everybody has to go out there with um, every Sunday and know that they're going to win their battle in front of them. Every single play and play with the intensity, you're going to win every single play and just dominate the person in front of you. I think if everybody goes out there with that individual attitude, then I think as a team, you're going to be a winner. The guys uh, are excited, and I think for the first time in many years, um, we believe that we can win and go to the playoffs. It is truly an exciting time for the Chiefs. In 1984, they learned that team unity and cohesion are essential if success is to follow. The task in 1985 is to pick up where they left off. One thing is certain. The Kansas City Chiefs enter the new season as a team together.